So, um, so thank, thanks very much for um, letting me speak to you. I've um, basically going to give you a slight overview of TB, the kind of pathogenesis, then walk through the kind of urological aspects of this, um, urogenital aspects of it. And then what I suggest is at the end of the session, we have a discussion about um, what, what is more applicable locally for yourselves as well as what is appropriate. Um, and I'm very aware that obviously, in fact, I mean, I was in Uganda just before um, the COVID lockdown started and uh, visited a good colleague of mine called William Rodri, who's a respiratory physician. I'm actually respiratory, but my main subspecialty is TB. And so um, it's, it's a great pleasure to be able to speak to you. So I'm going to try to share my slides, if I may. Um, first thing is obviously to make this thing work. So let's see where we are. Okay, I hope you can see that. I'm going to try to make this full screen now. Yes, we can see. Okay. Great. So um, I'm based in London. This is Paddington, which is in West London. Some of you may have heard of Oxford Street, the great shopping street. We're about a mile or two away from that. You just hop down the bus and get there in a minute. And um, it serves a population that's quite large, but we, we will look in Northwest London, look after about 2000 TB patients. So just to give you the kind of magnitude of what we have, um, but again, this is probably very small numbers compared to what you have to deal with um, locally. So the, the first thing is about the definitions of what um, genital urinary or urogenital TB are. And the first uh, place to start is obviously we're going to start down the tracks. The urethra, bladder, ureters, kidneys are applicable across both sexes. But in the male, obviously, we're now then talking about the scrotum, penis, testis, epididymis, vas deferens. Whereas in the female tract, um, from the vulva upwards into the fallopian tubes and ovaries, um, those organs can be affected. So that's, that's the territory we're talking about. And actually, the first... <laughs> thing to probably explain is uh, when we, we describe GU or urogenital TB, the term terminology is preferred to use urogenital. And the reason for that is because, in fact, in terms of frequency, um, urological TB is, is much more frequent than genital, genital urinary as such. So the urinary side seems to be more dominant overall. And again, we can to try to unpick why that might be the case. So some epidemiology first. Um, in terms of GU or UGTB, what percentage will have pulmonary, who have pulmonary disease will have GUTB? And that varies depending on where you work and where you live. So in, in developed countries, this is a, is a lower percentage. So about 2 to 10% of people with pulmonary TB will have um, urogenital TB. And uh, in terms of developing countries, this is a higher proportion. So we think up to 20% may have urogenital involvement. And the great predominance in terms of the global incidence of TB, it is not surprising that 90% of these cases are coming from developing countries. A couple of interesting facts. So um, this is a study from Brazil where they found about 10% of all cases of TB or at autopsy were also found to have GUTB, which may be clinically silent, obviously. And in Germany, again, an autopsy-based study, um, about 3% of those 
uh, subjects had evidence of GU or UGTB. In the UK, um, looking at this inversely is that 13% of people with genital urinary or urogenital TB had concurrent lung disease uh, involving TB. So just, just to get a kind of sense of proportion, um, it, it's not the predominant organ, obviously lungs are still the most dominant site of active disease, but you could argue that if you look for it hard enough, um, a substantive proportion do have TB in the urogenital tract. So um, I'm just showing you a slide from the UK. This is um, the UK Health Security Agency report from 2021, which reports one year back. So you can have figures here from 2020. And in fact, in the UK, we have a kind of slightly atypical pattern compared to the rest of the world, which is only if about 50% of our cases have pulmonary TB. And um, when you then add in extra pulmonary TB, that accounts for at least about half of our cases. But here is our genitourinary percentage, and you'll see this is 2%. So relatively small, um, but certainly a recognized manifestation of TB, even in a developing developed country's um, standing. Okay, so this slide is to try to illustrate the um, natural history and the spectrum of, and I use the word spectrum advisedly, most of you are aware of this loci here, which is that of latent TB. And that is when there is a viral organism you have inhaled at some stage uh, during your life, it sits in the lung in a granuloma. And that remains quiescent. And in the majority of cases, i.e. 85 to 90% of cases, this never activates and just sits there as a viable organism. And then all of you, I hope, are also aware of active TB where there is um, disease um, that's manifest radiologically as well as clinically in patients in the lung. Subclinical TB disease um, is a kind of emerging phenotype, which is that people are intermittently positive. They may very well be asymptomatic. So most of them are mild or with no symptoms at all. But we recognize this group more and more as people get scanned for some reason um, or have some other extra pulmonary manifestation. And then we look in the lung, we see disease there, but the patient would not have declared it themselves. So this is an important group that's emerging. What we understand least of is the infection eliminated group. And with some of these, we think that with the innate immune response, there's complete eradication of the organism as it enters and you completely clear it. And then there's infection eliminated, who are the group that may have an immune signal, i.e. either tuberculin skin test or an interferon gamma release assay, showing that they have met the disease, but in fact, there's no viable organism, as opposed to latent, where we know there's viable organism and immune recognition of uh, antigen. So when you take all those things um, in mind, we're going to move on to the next um, interesting fact, I think, about TB in the urogenital tract. So what's quite well recognized is that um, there have been several case reports of patients manifesting with their active urological TB many decades after what was known to be the first uh, infection. This is also the case looking at Mycobacterium bovis, which, as you know, is the form of bovine TB, which also was found many years after initial infection. And, and what is it about the kidneys that makes it a preferred site? Well, one issue is it has a beautiful blood supply. And, and therefore, 20% of your cardiac output is going straight into the kidney. So if you have any hematogenous phase of TB, and it's probably much more common than one might think, that that blood supply, plus the effect of having a very high oxygen tension in the cortex, means it's a favored site. And then what about the other manifestations of testicular disease, prostate, et cetera, and ureteric involvement? Is that hematogenous? Well, that's likely, in fact, just anterograde dissemination from the kidney. So 
The kidneys are a really important place to start when one thinks about how TB um, disseminates and progresses. This is um, a picture from a really a great review, which I suggest you consider reading um, after today, if you want to go into more depth. This is from Nature Reviews three years ago um, by uh, Dr. Munir, uh, who I think is a urologist, and uh, the senior author is uh, Professor Zumler from University College Hospital London. I'm gonna cut this up a little bit to make it more um, kind of viewable to yourself. So here is um, someone who is inhaling most commonly or ingesting TB. So you've got tonsillar tissue already meeting the organism, but if it's lung inhale, basically it's hitting um, the lung, you inhale it, and then you develop your primary gone complex. And most of you are aware the gone complex is the granuloma, but also a lymphatic um, connection to the hilum. And this, this is the kind of primary gone complex, which is where we think the TB initially resides and then disseminates. So if you do not control it at this phase, you will then develop primary or, or later reactivation TB by dissemination either through the nodes, either the thoracic duct or via the aorta in terms of hematogenous spread. Obviously, in particularly bovine TB, you ingest it and it goes down into the stomach. And then the next phase is this then hits, in fact, the, the kidneys because of the, the passage of blood as well as the lymphatic drainage. And um, then this anterograde dissemination into the bladder, et cetera, but also a possible contribution directly from nodal um, dissemination as well as hematogenous spread. But we, we think probably the most important organ in this type of setting is the kidney. And here is a pictogram of the uh, granuloma hitting the glomerulus and again spreading through lymphatics or for that matter um, through the loop of Henle down into the uh, urinary system. Um, and then causing spread. So it's, it's kind of, I think, nice way of trying to understand where TB may be starting. Okay, so just reiterating. So here's a kind of more simplified diagram um, from a nice, another nice review from the Singapore Medical Journal. Here is my primary complex spreading either hematogenously or via lymphatics to the cortex. Um, ca causing granulomas and then progressing. And this reactivation, if you remember, can be many years later. And as it extends, you get necrosis and then frank cavities destroying the kidneys and then going into the collecting system. And in advanced disease, you'll get scarring um, involving the infundibulum as well as pelvic strictures. Um, and then finally, destruction of the entire kidney um, results in complete caseation and therefore lack of function um, and calcification. I'm gonna show you some examples of that. So here is um, a demonstration of the papillary necrosis in this uh, kidney section uh, from a post-mortem. Um, this is from the American Journal of Nephrology in 2001, so an old publication. They had some very good pictures, I think, of this. And this is the pyonephrosis, extensive caseation, necrosis, and the parenchyma being completely destroyed. So what then about the genital tract? Well, here you can get it um, through direct Primary genital TB can occur in a female, and they have a partner who has themselves either a genital urinary TB or they have pulmonary TB, and that could be through infected semen or sputum. And in fact, TB of the penis is kind of in itself an interesting one because they they seem to be sorry sorry about the type typographical error, but 
you could have someone being infected from a kind of procedure if they have prothrombin TB or in fact ejaculation from proximal disease. Um, and then contact with endometrial secretions again now from the female partner who has um, active uterine TB. Or you may get it as a secondary disease from other primary sites, but it's likely um, this is all um, secondary from more proximal disease. So um, let's go on. There is a staging. Um, that is sometimes used. We don't use this in the UK, so I, I'm not sure that you might be using this locally, but I, I think the way to think about it is about the, the natural history and how it marches through in terms of the extent of disease. So I think it's useful from what I'm saying, stage four is very bad, it's everywhere, um, but probably as long as you understand where the disease might be, that would, that's the most important thing rather than knowing what stage it is. So again, uh, some nice descriptions here to, illustrated by the pictures. And this is again from the review by Munir, which um, has some great pictures to show you. So this is macroscopic caseation in a kidney surface. And B is in the renal parenchyma. C is, you can see granulomas here forming within the kidney with giant cells in some central necrosis. And in fact, on this Zeal Nielsen, you can see some bacilli staining. Okay, so this is obviously very um, marked TB. You can actually see the organisms. And then this is end-stage kidney disease with destruction uh, of the renal tissue as well as lobar caseation. Uh, this is a CT scan showing a non-opacified dilated upper calyx. And again, I won't pretend that I can read urograms as well as you can, because I'm sure you read them more than I do. And then more detailed cuts as again, this is contrast in our CT showing a dilated upper calyx on the right. Here is an upper pole, which again has fully, fully caseated in the middle. And this is a path sample showing caseation and parenchyma destruction. So this um, description I used before, putty kidney. Um, in J, we have calcification. And this is a plain x-ray of the kidneys again showing calcification. And similarly here, um, calcification. And this is at an uh, operation, and this is again gross destruction, but calcification as well of the kidney. So, this is really fairly end stage. The ureters are obviously um, the next organ along, well, organ is the wrong word, but next structure along. And so, uh, it is said that the lower third are the commonest followed by the urethro-pelvic junction. And you get these um, areas of stricture, which are alternating. So you get proximal dilatation and stricture formation. So a corkscrew appearance. Um, again, I think you'd probably be better placed than me to say what these look like urologically uh, on imaging, but a sawtooth ureter or pipe stem ureter when there's a fibrotic issue and the ureters actually shorten. So um, again, you can see calcification. This is not specific, obviously, to TB. And the key point, though, is if you end up having kidney or renal TB, then downstream ureteric involvement is frequent. And the key point here is that you, as a urologist, are likely to have to intervene in terms of a obstructive uropathy. And uh, we can talk a little bit about how one approaches these, again, in, in uh, local practice. Bladder, TB, again, uh, this is downstream in terms of mixed organ along following the ureter, and this is up to 20% of people who um, have the TB originating the kidneys. You can get spread, as I said, from other sites if there's lymphatic or blood vessels spread. 
Um, and some people, it may start the other way around, which is you cut, start with genital TB and then you get retrograde sp spread. Um, one interesting phenomenon, at least in the developed um, country setting, would be interesting to hear whether you have uh, use of intravesical BCG, which is used for bladder carcinoma. And we see uh, sporadic cases where they have um, what we call BCGosis or, or bladder um, TB. Again, with this, there's generalized edema inflammation, but tuberculomas, the bladder wall, may well cause um, filling defects. This in itself can obviously cause problems in terms of the urotero vesical junction, um, and you get reflux as well as obstruction. Um, inflammation within the bladder wall and dextrusa itself will reduce the bladder capacity. And we'll show you some pictures around that. And in severe cases, you may get um, fistulation occur either to the bowel or vagina or colon, um, as well as the potential for bladder perforation. And leaving the bladder infected with TB may give you ureteric um, obstruction, but also contraction of the bladder itself. Um, I have here a case report just to illustrate this is issue with BCG installation. So um, an 83 year old man who developed um, bladder TB following BCG therapy and in fact ended up uh, unfortunately having to have a bilateral orchidectomy. So here are some pictures of ureteric um, disease. Here is a stricture and with dilatation um, proximally. And this is, I think, a kind of retro grade um, view. Here is bladder TB illustrated not only by strictures and reflux, but also if you will see the, the bladder size, and this is a very severe case of retrograde reflux um, from the bladder into the ureters. This one shows complete obstruction um, leading into the bladder, so uh, that's a kind of non-functioning side. So in terms of gynecological TB, this can be due to um, peritoneal spread, or again, as I said, hematogenous, which I'm sure you've all got the idea of now. And most have fallopian tube involvement. Most are bilateral and um, more rare to end up in the cervix or vagina, but certainly uterine ovarian involvement, but fallopian tubes um, primarily. And this group generally will not present with systemic symptoms. They may have pain or bleeding and um, is a important source of infertility, uh, at least in developing countries. So you'll see here in Nigeria, there's a figure of half a percent. And in India, it's probably a cause of a third of tubal infertility. Um, one thing that throws some of us off, and we see this from time to time when people are investigating pelvic disease of any sort, they do a CA125 looking for malignancy. And you should all be aware that CA125 is unfortunately elevated as well, and therefore not um, a rule out test, uh, nor highly specific, particularly in a high incidence country with TB, you just need to be aware it can be elevated. Here are some pictures, again, just to illustrate the um, involvement here. This is looking at uh, the fallopian tube mucosa. You can see these little milia, which are little granulomas forming. This is um, pelvic inflammation showing adhesions. And this is a laparoscopic examination. And D is a HSG examination. And you can see here fallopian tube strictures. And this one E is complete blockage of the left side and um, also spillage on the right, um, showing distal blockage. So 
quite affected um, individual. Okay, what about the um, male genital system? Again, uh, likely hematogenous, because obviously there's no direct ureteric involvement, uh, apart from the prostate. Um, and this again, commonest in 20, 40 years old. Scrotal swelling, normally unilateral, um, occasionally will present with abscess or sinuses and it, the kind of classic epididymal texture that of a kind of rubbery nodular um, epididymal examination. Prostate said is relatively rare. And again, from the same review, here is a fistulogram um, showing is the prostate with destruction, but with a fistula there. And here is um, an ultrasound of the testis showing, the, can you see these parenchymal lesions within it? And here is a path sample showing caseation, replacing testicular tissue, and then several granulomas, multinucleated cells. This is in the testis, this is the seminal vesicles, and um, this is showing the giant cells within the granulomas. So presentations in terms of the male system, again, systemic symptoms are unusual. They may um, have pain, dysuria. And if you remember, if you are unfortunate enough to have a thimble bladder, are you really contracted bladder? You'll obviously um, be much more aware of symptoms then. Testicular mass is another classic presentation. And in terms of severe involvement, obviously you then end up with renal dysfunction, hypertension. And um, this phenomenon, which is a diffuse interstitial nephritis. So, how do we diagnose this? And the kind of standard would be the finding of having a midstream urine and then noticing that in fact, there's a sterile pyuria should raise alarm bells. Um, particularly if the microscopy shows pus cells, but there's no evidence of bacteria at all. So hematuria, proteinuria, um, obviously correlates of inflammation. The classic, um, investigation is an early morning urine and you are meant to get a good volume first thing in the morning so we have at least in the uk these big tubs of 150 mils that we ask people to pee into first thing in the morning and those then get concentrated down however even in culture proven cases we know the smear sensitivity is only about 50 percent I'm going to talk a little bit about the polymerase chain reaction and potential additional value as well as the urinary lipoarabinomanan lamb. Um, one thing to point out is you sometimes will get falsely positive microscopy with contaminants, uh, e.g. Mycobacterium spagmatis. So, I'm just going to illustrate the potential power of PCR, polymerase chain reaction. This is a uh, study, I believe, from India. And they looked at 257 suspects in their local hospital. What they did was then looked at various biopsies from the area. So this is endometrial, about 100 endometrial, curetin 42, menstrual blood, semen, central tissue urine and looked at the yield of the PCR. Now, this is not a straightforward commercially available one. So um, we're going to talk a little bit about the currently more widely available gene expert, but this is using um, a specific primer looking for MPB64. So this is positive by culture, which you can see is still relatively small, smear even smaller depending on which sample you've taken. But the PCR seems to give you an additional sensitivity potentially. And um, so this was kind of 
I think interesting to show the sensitivity of PCR may be um, very important. There's a more recent paper from China um, looking now at the gene expert cartridge, and most of you are aware oh, what's going on there. This is a um, cartridge that you can take the primary sample and prepare it, put it in the cartridge, and you will have a response within two hours. Now, I think this was not done with the, with the current cartridge, which is called the Ultra, which is, I've shown you a picture up there, but the old gene expert. And this still showed um, for culture positivity and clinically diagnosed a sensitivity of 95% culture positive. And then look at the smear microscopy, it was only 40%, which is in keeping with um, data I've shown you earlier. And here is someone with um, a clinical diagnosis. So as you know, with extra pulmonary TB, sometimes you are going to have to treat despite not growing the organism. So again, if we take that as a, as a believable real um, group with gold standard of culture, um, in a clinical diagnosis setting, gene expert gave you a sensitivity of 63%, again, versus smear of 18%. And cultures, 45%. So what the data are telling you is it is possible that the PCR will give you a more sensitive test than even culture. Um, they did a sense check whether this made uh, kind of reality uh, the likeliest thing. And what they did was they looked at their migrant population versus the resident population. And again, the proportion of urinary or urological TB was high in that group. So a sense check to at least show us it is likely these are um, real cases that are being detected. So their, their finding from this particular paper was that the PCR outperformed certainly the smear, which is not hard given the poor yield of that, but also a, a slightly larger yield and culture alone for the detection of MTB. So I think this is um, at least useful data to know that if you use GeneXpert um, or any other PCR cartridge, I'm not um, advocating you only use expert if you've got other modalities, but certainly the, the concept of using polymerase chain reaction is at least compelling. So I just wanted to mention urinary LAM here. Um, there is only one commercially available test which is validated by WHO. So this is the Alera um, antigen test. So this is a, you put the urine onto the paper and it runs um, an antibody screen for antigen. Um, it is not specific to DB, but it is a tool that is particularly now validated for HIV disease. And again, just to stress, this means that the amount of disease someone has is relatively high. So this is in terms of WHO and what is being recommended for. This is now advocated as a really helpful tool diagnostically in HIV. And in that setting, it seems to reduce death um, as well as starting people on treatment earlier. So these are good things. So I had a look at what data there is on LAM. Um, so first thing to say is, I don't think we have direct head-to-head -head evidence of the sensitivity and specificity in a TB setting for urogenital or genitourinary TB. So we don't have that specific subgroup to be able to tell you today whether PCR or LAM is better. Um, I just would point you to some of the figures around the sensitivity. So this is HIV negative group. Um, but again, remember we're talking about TB rather than urogenital TB. So the TB may be anywhere. And that in an HIV negative setting, that sensitivity is at least only 30%. And you can see the specificity here because LAM is um, expressed by other mycobacterium. So that sensitivity 
is generally higher if you've got low CD4 counts again because you are unable to contain the disease and therefore we believe you have more hematogenous spread. Um, Fuji LAM is the other um, urinary LAM test that is out there. WHO seem to have any um, validated the Alera cartridge. So in terms of Im imaging, we've gone through this a little bit with some of the pictures I've shown you before. We've got um, uh, our standard IVU, IVP, and again, this is there to demonstrate the calluses are abnormal. There may be pelvic ureteric narrowing, again, with stricturing. And calcification is common in the kidney and prostate. And again, I've shown you several examples of this. Ultrasound is least specific. Um, it may show you hydronephrosis. It will show you small kidneys, but it's not going to tell you that this is TB related necessarily. CT scan does give you calcification as well as um, involvement of the parenchyma being more visible, but obviously will also demonstrate clubbing of calyces. The added advantage is if you see a psoas abscess um, nearby, then you can be fairly sure this is TB related. And then isotope rhinography, just to look at um, early ureteric obstruction and give you a sense more of function uh, of the kidneys may be useful in terms of making a decision about whether you should resect um, a kidney when it is largely non-functioning. PET scan, we certainly use um, in a developed country setting, um, high cost and high radiation. Um, the beauty of this is we use it to look at early disease where a the, the signal on activity may be very, very sparse in relative terms. So that allows us to look for occult disease and then to target in terms of biopsies. MRI, I don't have a huge um, experience base with in terms of looking specifically at the kidneys. I think obviously all the other modalities already um, show us what TB looks like. Um, one vignette, which is important, if you remember, I showed you some figures showing that even in what looks like just urogenital TB, a proportion will have lung TB. And therefore it is worth you imaging the chest. It's not only, only does that potentially allow for sampling from the lung, but also um, may give you a clue that this is TB related, what you're seeing in the genital urinary tract. So worthwhile just doing an X-ray, a chest X-ray. In terms of gynae imaging, um, classic is a HSG. And again, you're looking for fallopian constriction, obstruction, adhesions, and obliteration of the uterus. So a couple of pictures here. This is um, a CT scan. And you can see that the calyces are abnormal. And this is a CT IVU looking at filling defects um there within the calyces but also ure urethral uh, ureteric um, distortion so this is again another ct scan looking at dilatation of the calyces um the blue arrow is showing patchy cortical enhancement and this is a thickened bladder wall here. Similarly, more um, CT on the left and ultrasound on the right. Um, you can see here dilated calyces, a collection here. And on the ultrasound, it looks like a septate abscess. And in fact, they biopsy this using, I think, ultrasound guidance and found MTB. Um, here is a prostate. This is after, if you remember, um, intravesical B BCG therapy. And again, this I think shows you, again, I don't understand ADC mapping, but allegedly this does show evidence of involvement within the prostate. And on this ultrasound, low attenuation lesions. So again, this was biopsied using the ultrasound and that grow TB. 
Um, here's a prostate. So I think using enhancement techniques, you can see more, and this is showing you quite a kind of active left side of the prostate. And this is now epididymal and seminal vesicle. Again, you're probably better off um, showing these than I am. Here's the ultrasound image, and this is the CT image. Okay, so then going on to surgery, um, you've investigated, you've taken your samples, and a couple of things emerge in terms of looking at practice here. One is for the severely damaged kidney where there may be recurrent UTIs, suddenly there is um, good reasonable sense of removing this um, because it becomes then self-perpetuating, although you may have sterilized it for TB with your treatment. And then I talked a lot about the um, downstream abnormalities. And so you've got calicele problems um, as well as ureteric problems and anastomoses, as well as substitution using um, the ileum in terms of passing urine if there is a uropathy from obstruction. Um, obviously, sorry, I haven't even put down there the, the role of stenting, which uh, may occur, but it depends how extensive it is. Finally, down to treatment. Well, this actually is no different to TB elsewhere. The WHO short course therapy is what is recommended, um, which, if you will remember, is four drugs, rifampicin, isoniazid, perizinamide, ethambitol for two months, then followed by rifampicin, isoniazid for four months. So there's no change there. And, and one of the pluses uh, in terms of the, at least the kind of urogenital involvement is rifampicin does get excellent concentration within the kidneys and therefore um, should be at high concentrations to the target organ. Steroids, there is no evidence of using this in straightforward um, urogenital TB. I think some of us may be tempted to use it in terms of uh, ureteric disease in terms of trying to reduce any stricture formation, but there, there are no RCTs to guide that. Therefore, the only real indication is if you end up with kidney failure with interstitial nephritis from TB, then certainly oral corticosteroids um, can be used and we would use it in that setting. And in fact, the renal physicians would be driving that um, strategy and dosing. We've talked a little bit about excisional surgery as well as reconstruction. So I think you're, you're all probably going to be best placed to talk and discuss the excisional side of things and reconstruction rather than me. Um, but I'm just hopeful that that's given you an overview of um, your gentle TB and it will be good to have a discussion with yourselves where you may have a lot more experience about this. Thanks very much for listening. Thank you, Dr. Kwan. That was awesome. So happy to take questions or comments. As I say, I think some of you will probably see much more urological TB than I will. So uh, it'd be good to hear your experience and what you do. Does anyone have any questions? Or even comments would be good. Go ahead, Dr. Kingaga. Okay. Thank you very much, Dr. Kohn, for the presentation. Um, we apologize for to urology. You did really a lot of research to get us this nice presentation. Um, key to the diagnosis, like you said, it's still difficult, not straightforward, but I've been picking some of the, the key issues you, you presented, especially 
for kidney, one of the features we should look out for is, uh, which we, de we discuss in radiology is the, the uneven dilatation of the calluses. It's usually uneven that differentiates it from others, like for a stone or a PU job obstruction. Here, most cities you showed clearly will show either upper pole alone, the calluses or middle alone. So that is key in the urology. Uh, we are told to look out for it. Uh, my question is for the epididymis. You could have chronic inflammation of the epididymis, uh, swelling and inflammation, and during surgical excision, TB is suspected as well as a tumor is suspected. In this case, uh, what's the best sample the pathologist could use to read TB? Is it okay to combine both in a formalin or do you think we should separate them? Yeah, I think if you, for your best chance of diagnosis, I mean, obviously the formalin will give you the granulomas, right? Um, but I mean, the two reasons for trying to separate them, at least in UK practice, you would advocate it is, is because, and again, I don't know the figures locally to you, but you are then talking about things like drug resistance and the real emerging problem globally. So we, we, we like to kind of try to grow it anyway. Um, I think if you see granulomas in your setting, obviously that is very compelling for TB. Um, and again, I don't know how um, available culture is because it's not always available for everyone either, but it sounds like uh, Dr. Kiongo, this is available for you. Yes, we have some um, academic labs. They can do culture. But... Yeah, so ideally you separate, I think. Okay, so one sample would be probably in, in saline. The, yeah. The other question um, for the early morning urine, which is the best representation urine sample, should we request both microscopy uh, and gene expert, for example, a slide and gene expert, or since gene expert is better, we could do one? So that Chinese study, if you take it as representative of everywhere else, shows that gene expert has a higher sensitivity than even culture. So again, that's kind of useful, but again, it, uh, certainly in the UK practice, we would do a PCR, we would send it for culture, you do a smear. So in fact, we do all three. And the reason for doing that again is the gene expert just gives you one drug resistance. Okay, if you remember, that's the way the cartridge works. It gives you the RPO gene mutations that encode for rifampicin resistance. What it doesn't tell you, unfortunately, is um, whether there's MDRT, which is resistant to isoniazid rifampicin, or for that matter, any of the other second-line drugs. So we, we love using PCR in extra primary TB because I think it, it shows very promising results, but we still are culturing all of these. If you're saying if you have to choose one in a resource limited setting, and uh, because obviously sample wise, you've got plenty of sample, right? Um, if you're forced to take one, then I suppose you'd go for the gene expert, at least based on the data at the moment. Okay, uh, thank you. Lastly, I, I pick that um, TB lamb, the test was, is not designed for genital urinary. It was a source of confusion for me, but it's for generally TB and HIV positive patients. Yes, exactly. So if you have high, high um, volume disease, lamb, lamb, that's what it was designed for, it was to diagnose TB as opposed to urogenital TB. Um, but obviously, the higher the concentration, like the more likely you are to to see a signal on it. I mean, I think it's a clever test. Just uh, you you need to understand the context it was studied in. Okay, thank you very much. Those yeah. are my yeah. questions. Got a couple of hands up. Um, Toto Shabani. First. Yeah. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much uh, for the presentation. 
uh, I apologize you uh, because the urina uh, urinary tuberculosis is very very it's not easy it's not easy to to have a diagnosis uh, because in my experience uh, at Burundi I had a patient uh, a young young patient uh, who have uh, typically uh, symptom symptoms of the uh, of uh, tuberc tuberculosis, uh, but he had a nodule, a testicular nodule. Uh, so we we made uh, just uh, histology, uh, and we we found we found the diagnosis of uh, testicular tuberculosis. Right. Uh, the patient. Uh, we treat, uh, we treated him uh, with a uh, uh, with a me uh, medicine medical uh, with drug, uh, but uh, of uh, six six months, and uh, he had a good evolution. So, uh, in our country, uh, in our country, it's very very difficult to to have uh, a diagnosis. Uh, uh, a really a early diagnosis of uh, gen uh, genital urinary tuberculosis. Mm -hmm. uh, so, uh, what about because it, uh, because it, uh, in Burundi we have many many uh, many many uh, urinary inf infection cases, right? Epid epidemics. Uh, can. Uh, is possible or is a uh, is a good idea to to check tuberculosis for all cases with a, with infection can be a good idea. Well, I think again you're going to have to go down to what facility is available to you because obviously if that's a very high cost approach, I know. I mean, I mean. As a percentage, if you remember, what do you think is your Burundian experience? What what is the percentage of people with TB versus straightforward infections? What do you think that figure would be? If it's a very low figure, you could argue the amount of testing you have to do is is excessive, right? If you're are you talking about urine? Or are you talking about um, actual biopsy samples? By the way, yeah, just urine. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, as I say, we it's it's difficult for me to comment on. I would think that you're going to end up then doing a lot of tests with uh, kind of relatively low yield, aren't you? If you indiscriminately test, don't don't you think if that you would evoke a TB test if it was um, sterile pyuria? Isn't that the best way of you screening who to send? If you see what I mean. That would be your kind of first level of um, threshold to think about sending those samples. You'd have to ask the patient probably to come back and potentially give you EMUs. But I, I, I would say testing everyone might be difficult in terms of resource. Right, uh, Fred Currier. Uh, thank you very much. Dr. Kuria. Dr. Kuria, sorry, your um, I can't make up your voice at all. Dr. Curia, do you think you could type your question in the chat? Fairly straightforward one, but the prostatitis. They are pretty. Uh, do you now hear me? 
That's slightly better. Right where I am, I will type. It. I think he he might be logging back in. Okay. Oh wait, there he is. Oh. Dr. Curia, if you can, maybe type your question in the chat and Dr. Kong can answer it. Okay, let me do so, let me do so. Not sure if the typing is coming through. Ah, comment on drug therapy and outcome of TB prostatitis. So, as I said, the the cure rate of TB in a fully sensitive disease is at least ninety five percent, and that is normally achieved by six months. I think the only exception to that, I suppose, is if there's a deep seated abscess and you don't think drug penetration is sufficient. But I think for the prostate, which I, as, as I understand, it has a relatively good blood supply, that shouldn't be an issue. So I would expect the individual to do very well. Now, whether they then have um, repercussions of having had inflammation in the system is the issue rather than can you kill the organism? Most of us would think that six months of um, standard treatment, provided the patient has sensitive disease, is sufficient. I hope that un answers that question, uh, Dr. Kerr, yeah. Okay. Are there any other comments or questions? We interesting to hear um, from yourselves as to uh, anything in that presentation that doesn't look real to you or in in reality what you do. I mean, I've mentioned a lot of tests there that we can do. I just interested to hear what radiology access you have, and as well as the molecular testing. Ironically. Molecular testing, because it's of WHO, may be more available abroad than in a developed country, um, which is because it's it's really rolled out globally as the diagnostic tool. But we're talking respiratory samples. Okay, I think probably an hour is now too long for everyone. <laughs> We've worn you all out. Uh, we have another hand up from Dr. Kikonga. Yes, Dr. Kon, you, the tests which you listed for investigations, in Uganda we have, yes, most of them. Maybe the test I didn't see, some people um, get recurrent lower urinary tract symptoms like frequency right. and agents and uh, dysuria and we have to do a cystoscopy okay yeah okay yes i didn't and, put cystoscopy uh, yes so on cystoscopy um in the last one year i've seen only one patient with the urinary tb it was in the kidneys and bladder and chronic bladder pain and we we got the first idea from cystoscopy. We were looking for the cause of bladder pain. So you saw and, the uh, granulomas, did you, in the bladder wall? Yes. No, no. The, the, the bladder was non-compliant on cystoscopy. Okay. Fibrosis. 
it can't relax and take water. And the biopsy just showed chronic inflammation. The biopsy was done, the pathologist just told us chronic inflammation and we were stuck. Um, until when a, a morning urine gene expert identified TB. Oh, very good. Gene expert, yeah, that, that, that's so a cystoscopy and biopsy could sometimes be indicated. Okay, yes, that's great. Thank you. Anyone else? Well, thank you so much for your time, Dr. Kwan. It was an absolute pleasure to have you. No, pleasure. And th thanks very much. A um, uh, real privilege to be able to speak to you. All right, if that's it for everybody, we'll wrap this up. Thank you, Dr. Kingongo, Dr. Kiria, Dr. Kitesa, and Dr. Kazabinko for helping coordinate. Thank you very much. Thank you to you two for finding us, Dr. Kong. Nice to speak to you. All the best to you. All right, everybody have a great Thank evening. You so much. Thank you.